Okay, so welcome to biological psychology. Biological psychology encompasses a lot of science, so I encourage you to not only listen to my lecture, I am going to also provide a number of different videos as we go throughout the chapters um, from YouTube that might also be helpful to you because um, we'll have so many um, scientific terms to know. So please make sure that you take notes, that you read the chapter so that you're prepared for the information. So we're going to start today with chapter one, which is all about nerve cells and nerve impulses. So when we think about the nervous system, your ability to engage in mental exercises depends on a number of activities um, based on neurons that exist in your brain. So we can begin to understand how your thinking and how your brain works by looking at the nervous system. So to do that, we're going to start with talking about two kinds of cells. There are neurons and glial cells that both make up your nervous system. Your body has more than 86 billion neurons, and they are all working together to make sure that you're able to function on a day-to-day -day basis. So a long time ago, in the late 1800s, there was a Spanish investigator who wanted to determine or kind of look at whether or not um, all of the nervous system is connected and always working together. And that was Santiago Ramon Cajal. And what he did was he um, tried to demonstrate that individual cells that, that make up the nervous system are actually separate. And he was able to show us that there are some cells that do not merge together as had been previously thought, that they are separate entities that work together, but um, they're not necessarily always connected. It's not one thing. So like any other cell in the body, neurons have many different structures and parts. Um, here are six of the main uh, parts of the, the body that neurons make up. There's a membrane, there's a nucleus, mitochondria, ribosomes, and endoplasmic reticulum. So these are all biology terms that I'm sure you remember from being in a biology class. So if you look at that picture, it shows you what some of those individual parts look like. And we're going to talk about what their function is in detail. Starting with the membrane. The cell membrane separates the inside of a cell from the outside environment. So it's going to separate the cell from the outside environment. The nucleus is what's going to contain all of the chromosomes and, and make up sort of your DNA and any uh, genetic makeup that exists in your body. The mitochondrion is going to perform any type of metabolic activity that can give you energy that your, um, that your body and your cells need. So all of your aerobic energy, your metabolism is all housed in the mitochondria. Ribosomes, those are the sites um, at which cells synthesize new protein molecules because they, you know, those protein molecules are going to be the building material that the cell needs. So if you take a look at the orange material up on the left of the picture, there's an example of ribosomes. And then we have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is right below those ribosomes, which tell us um, that's the network of thin tubes that are going to help transport any synthesize proteins um, that's happened in the ribosomes to their new location. So these, all of these parts are all working together to help you function. Now, as we talk about that, it's also important for us to talk about the different types of neurons that we can have. We can have motor neurons and sensory neurons. Motor neurons have to do with your muscles and your glands and your ability to move accurately. 
motor neurons have a soma. If you like, take a look at the picture, and they also have a um, they have a soma that's located in the spinal cord, and they are going to be receiving any type of excitatory information that's coming in from other neurons, so that they can pass that information along the ax axis to your muscles and glands, so that you're able to move properly on a regular basis. Your sensory neurons. These are also specialized neurons that are highly sensi sensitive, but they are mostly responsible for your sensations. Think of your five senses, your ability to touch and taste and hear and see. Things are all based on the sensory neurons that exist in your body. So you can take a look at the picture to see exactly what a sensory neuron looks like as well. So now let's kind of talk about the parts of a neuron. Here's a picture of a motor neuron, and we're going to kind of go through all of these parts to give you the basic um, idea of what a neuron looks like. I know that you guys have had general psychology before, so when you were in the uh, biological basis chapter, I know that this is something that probably came up. So this will just be touching on what exactly these parts of the of the um, neuron are responsible for, starting with dendrites. So dendrites are gonna be these tree-like branches that are right there in orange. They are responsible, so here's gonna be your dendrites right here. Your dendrites are going to be responsible for bringing information into the neuron because it's kind of like what receives all of the information the neuron needs. Some dendrites have spines that branch out and increase the area of uh, the dendrites, makes it much longer. Um, the greater the surface of the dendrites, the more information it can receive. So the dendrites is where information comes into the neuron. Then after we talk about the dendrites, it's important to look at the cell body, this part, the cell body or the soma. This is what contains the nucleus, the mitochondria, the ribosomes. Remember, we talked about those functions before. This is where all of your metabolic work is taking place, your, the ability of your metabolism to function. Um, the soma, our cell body, is also covered with synapses on its surface, um, and it is sort of protected there within the dendrite. Next, we have the axon. And the axon is this long area right here. It's thin, and it's responsible for transmitting the nerve impulses. The information the dendrite took in needs to be transferred down the axon so that it can go to other neurons, organs, and to your muscles. If you take a look, your neur the axon is covered by what's called a myelin sheath. The myelin sheath is an insulating material that helps the neural impulse travel down the axon. Okay, sometimes um, there's also these gaps within the myelin sheath. Those are known as the nodes of Ranvier right here. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And these presynaptic terminals are at the end of the axon. And this is where the chemicals are released that came from the dendrites so that communication can happen with other neurons in your body. So that's the basic sense of how a neuron works. It starts with bringing the information in through the dendrite, going down the axon as a neural impulse and going out the terminal buttons. Now, when we talk about the neurons and how they work, it's important to know about afferent and efferent axons because we know that the neural impulse is going to go down the axon, but if the axon is afferent, it's bringing information into the structure. An efferent axon is going to be carrying information away from the structure. If you take a look here, afferent is bringing information into the structure 
An efferent is taking the information, carrying it away from the structure, like a typical motor neuron. Notice that at, in a sensory neuron, it's afferent. In, an, in a motor neuron, it's efferent, okay? Interneurons are going to be sort of the connecting neurons right here. They have dendrites and axons that are contained within a single structure. So they're not exceptionally long and they're gonna connect neurons together. That's why they're called inner neurons. If you take a look at this picture here, um, A, B, C, D, and E show us various types of neurons that can exist. They can be big, they can be small, um, they can have different shapes and different functions. The shape of the neuron is going to determine how it connects with other neurons, such as the shape of an interneuron and things like that. The function is closely related to the shape as well. Now, that's kind of everything I need you to know about neurons from, from a basic perspective. Now let's talk about glia, okay? Because that is the other part that makes up our nervous system. So there are some different parts of glia cells as well. There's astrocytes. And astrocytes are going to help synchronize the activity that's happening at the axon by wrapping around pre, the presynaptic terminal and taking up chemicals that are released by the axon and re-releasing them. So if we take a look at our picture here, here our astrocytes are going to be located like this, and they are going to take up the chemicals that are released by the axon and then re-release them somewhere else. They, the astrocytes are gonna be responsible for dilating blood vessels so that more nutrients can get to the brain that will help you function. We also have microglia, uh oh, I'm sorry, went a little bit fast, microglia, are going to be like this structure here. The microglia is responsible for removing waste material, viruses, you know, fungi, things like that from the brain because we don't need those things. We also don't need neurons that are dead or dying. So the microglia is going to kind of clean up everything so that your body continues to function and continues to stay healthy. The, okay, so we have some other functions here. Starting with the ogliodendrocytes, which are located in the brain and spinal cord. So when we're thinking about the ogliodendrocytes, we're talking about those right here. And then we also have the swan cells, which are just like this. They're in the periphery of the body. So these two parts of the body are going to help build the myelin sheath that surrounds and insulate the axons. So the myelin sheath is able to be in the axon and help the axon function because the ogliodendrocytes and swan cells are helping it remain insulated and helping it remain strong for functioning. We also have the radioglia, glial cells, which are like this. They help guide the migration of neurons. They also help with the growth of the axons and dendrites, especially during embryonic development when babies are um, forming. And whenever that embryonic development finishes, those radial glia are going to differentiate into neurons. So they're going to 
change its function, they're going to become a smaller number and then also become astrocytes and oligodendrites in your brain and spinal cord and the peripheral of your body so that you can continue to function. Another part of the brain that that has a very important function is the blood brain barrier. This is going to be the part of the brain that is responsible for blocking chemicals, bad chemicals from entering into your bloodstream. So the um, your immune system can destroy and damage or infect various cells throughout your body. That's how people get sick is because of a weakened immune system. And because those neurons in the brain that have been destroyed cannot regenerate, it's going to be important for the blood brain barrier to block out any type of infection, viruses, or bacteria or other harmful material from entering into your bloodstream in order to keep you healthy. Continuing on with talking about the blood brain barrier, there's active transport. This is what occurs when it's a protein medicated process that is able to extend energy, expend energy and pump chemicals from the blood into the brain. Glucose, amino acids, and some hormones, a few vitamins, can also uh, be brought into the brain via active transport because we need those things in order to function and survive. But the blood-brain barrier is going to be essential to health because without it, it can allow um, certain chemicals to get into your body. For example, when people are going have cancer you know brain cancer and they're going through uh, chemotherapy um the blood brain barrier because remember it's supposed to block out anything that can be harmful um it can be a difficult thing if someone's going through chemotherapy because the blood brain barrier tries to block the success of that happening so it's trying to keep the body healthy but it's not allowing you know, the chemotherapy, the radiation to pass through the barrier. And sometimes that poses a problem. The endothelial cells form the lining of blood vessels and then they shrink and they can allow harmful chemicals to enter the brain. So the endothelial cells need to remain healthy and not you know, get too shrink too much because if they do, then chemicals can enter through the blood-brain barrier. Vertebrate new neurons depend on and need glucose. Glucose is a sugar that um, is naturally producing in your body and it's one of the few nutrients that can plas that can successfully pass through the blood-brain barrier. So you need the glucose in order to function, and neurons also need a steady supply of oxygen. About 20% of all oxygen in your body is consumed and used by the brain. There's also a vitamin, thiamine, um, that the body needs in order to use glucose. If there's a thiamine deficiency, it can lead to death of neurons, which sometimes happens with Korsakoff syndrome. So anytime somebody has used alcohol for chronic periods of time, they could be diagnosed with Korsakoff syndrome. And therefore, they show memory impairments because what's happened is those neurons in their brain that are responsible for memory have died due to thiamine deficiency because of alcohol use. If you take a look at the picture, it shows you what a normal 43-year-old brain should look like. And then the second picture shows you somebody who's been using alcohol chronically, what their brain looks like. And you can see how those neurons have died in the brain of the alcoholic 43-year-old. And that creates memory problems for them. 
Now let's talk about the nerve impulses. So whenever we have a nerve impulse, an electrical message is transmitted down the axon. We already talked about that. And it can be regenerated and, and move along. But the speed of a neural impulse is going to range from one meter per second to 100 meters per second. So it's a very fast process. Like the touch on the shoulder can reach the brain more quickly than the touch on the foot. Okay. So you touch your shoulder, that message is going to be sent to your brain a lot faster than touching your foot because your shoulder, of course, is much closer to your brain. Now, neurons are not always firing. We also have what's called a resting potential. So with the inside of the membrane um, moving very quickly, it is slightly negative with the respect to the outside. So it's approximately negative 70 millivolts. The resting potential of a neuron is going to refer to the state of the neuron before it sends a neural impulse down the dendrites and down the axons. When a neuron is at rest, the membrane is going to have an electrical gradient known as what's called polarization, which is a difference in the electrical charge that is both inside and outside of the cell. The membrane that is created is permeable, selectively permeable, which means it allows some chemicals to pass more freely through there than others. So it selectively decides, okay, which things can go through, which things can pass through. Sodium, potassium, and calcium, as well as chloride, are able to pass through the channels very easily. If the membrane is at rest, sodium channels are closed. Potassium channels are somewhat closed and allow slow passage of potassium, which is what you see here and here. The sodium potassium pump is a protein complex. So it is something that is able to pump three sodium ions out of the cell walls and draw in two potassium ions into the cell, as shown here in this picture. This is what's going to help maintain the electrical gradient, and it's going to use active transport, or what we call ATP. So if we look for those sodium ions and we look for those potassium ions, we can see that movement taking place. We also have electrical and concentration gradients. Here's a picture to represent that here. The electrical gradient and the concentration gradient are the difference in distribution of ions because those ions are working together to pull sodium ions into the cell. The electrical gradient is going to pull potassium ions into the cell like this, gonna move them inside. They can slowly though, those potassium cells can slowly leak out and they can carry a positive charge with them. And they can take that positive charge um, along with them. The concentration gradient occurs when a neuron is resting and there is more sodium on the outside like here, than there is on the inside. And more potassium is inside than it is outside. So this is an example of concentration gradient, everything you see here. Now let's talk about an action potential. 
So the resting potential is going to be stable until the neuron is stimulated, until we have something take place down the axon. We can have what's called hyperpolarization or depolarization in order to see that action potential take place. When it is hyperpolarized, that means that there is hyper, meaning more of, there's an increase in polarization or the difference between the electrical charge of two places. And depolarization is decreasing the polarization going down towards zero. The threshold of excitation is the level above which any stimulation produces a massive depolarization. So the threshold of excitation is going to be somewhere where if you go too high, then it's going to automatically cause depolarization. So when we have an axon, we have a rapid depolarization of the neuron. The action potential threshold is going to vary from neuron to neuron because they can't all be the same, but it is going to be consistent meaning it's going to always be an action potential, okay? The threshold for what's going to lead to depolarization can change as we see here, but then we notice a much lower threshold, but every action potential is going to be consistent. Stimulization of the neuron is going to pass the threshold and that's what's going to trigger a nerve impulse or an action potential. When it comes to our voltage activated channels, membrane cells whose permeability, their ability to pass through depends on the voltage difference between the membrane. So if we look here at this voltage, voltage gated sodium channels, we can see that there's sodium here. And we can see that it's easily passing through here. And here it's not, it's having to go away. And here it's closed, so it has to go away. When sodium channels are open, positively charged so sodium ions can rush through and get to the nerve cell. If they're closed, they have to go elsewhere. When it comes to the movement of sodium and potassium in the body, at the peak of an action potential, sodium channels are quickly closed. The neuron is returned to its resting state and the potassium channels are open. So potassium ions flow out due to the concentration gradient and, and take them with their positive charge. The sodium potassium pump is later going to restore the original distribution of ions. So it gets back to its um, regular resting state. In order to re restore the sodium potassium pump, ions, they have to take their time to do so. So action potentials will occur that can lead to a buildup of sodium within the axon. And we don't want that because that could be toxic. Um, and it could lead to like a stroke or it could occur after people have used certain drugs. So we've got to be able to get it back to its original state so none of those things happen. Sometimes sodium, ch sodium channels can be blocked um, by things such as um, anesthetic drugs um, and those can prevent an action potential for, from occurring. We also have the all or none law, which tells us that an action potential is going to occur or not occur, okay? Dendrites are gonna be more susceptible to structural changes that are responsible for learning. The all or nothing principle has to do with whether or not an action potential is equal in intensity and speed at, within any given neuron. And we've already said it's always going to be equal. To signal the difference between a weak stimulus and a strong stimulus, an action potential is going, it's going to be based on the timing, like when it occurs, but it's going to always have the same intensity. 
Action potentials can vary based on the neuron in terms of ampli amplitude, velocity, and shape. Studies of different mammal mammalian axons have shown that there are various different types of protein channels and therefore the characteristics of action potentials can be different in terms of amplitude, velocity, and shape. So when an action potential occurs, it's going to occur or not occur. And when it doesn't occur, that is because it's going through what's called a refractory period. This is a time when a neuron is going to resist another action potential occurring. I always tell students to think of a toilet flushing when they think of an action potential. When you go to the bathroom and you flush the toilet, if it's a regular working toilet, it's going to flush with the same intensity when you press the button. But there's a refractory period. There's a period where if you keep on trying to press the button, it's not going to flush anymore because of the refractory period. It needs to fill back up with water. That's the same thing that takes place in a neuron. It's gonna resist the production of another action potential because it has to wait. Propagation of an action potential occurs in a motor neuron whenever the action potential begins at the axon hillock, a, a swelling occurs where the axon exits the soma. The transmission of the action potential down the axon has to do with propagation. We already talked about the myelin sheath a little bit earlier when we were talking about the um, neuron and we talked about the myelin sheath being these kind of like bubble areas here that exist. They're interrupted by these nodes of reindeer because those are the parts that are unmyelinated. So they, 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 fat, they travel very fast, but sometimes they don't travel as fast as they can because of these nodes that kind of slow down the process. Your myelin is going to be um, composed of fats and protein. And we also have saltatory conduction. This is a jumping of the action potential from node to node. So that's saltatory conduction. It's jumping. That is what helps provide rapid conduction of the impulses. It helps the nerve conserve energy for the cell. And sometimes people who are diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, um, it's because the myelin sheath here on their axons has started to be destroyed or it started to deteriorate. And people who suffer from multiple sclerosis have poor muscle concentration. They can also sometimes have visual problems. It can be kind of debilitating. Um, and as far as research goes, um, there's no way of regenerating this myelin sheath. And lastly, we need to talk about local neurons. Local neurons lack axons. They exchange information only with the neurons that are very close to them, and they don't produce any action potentials. If a local neuron is stimulated, it's going to produce what's called a graded potential, which is when the membrane potentials vary in magnitude and do not follow the all or nothing principle. Okay, so those might fire all the time. Local neurons can depolarize or hyperpolarize in proportion to stimulation. So they're only going to communicate with their close neighbors, but not um, produce an action potential. Local neurons have also been very difficult for researchers to study because of their small size. So most of our knowledge about them come from the study of larger neurons. There is a myth um, that only 10% of neurons are active at any given time. That is not true. Many of your act, uh, neurons are active all the time. That's what helps you function on a day-to-day -day basis. And you are able to use your brain even when you're not thinking about it because those neurons are all working together. 
So I hope everything that we talked about makes sense for you in terms of neurons and nerve cells.